everybody welcome back to my channel we were talking about doing a series on serial killers for halloween and this is going to start it off in researching for this story it reminded me of a childhood memory is anybody else afraid of clowns i've been afraid of them forever i never liked them i never thought they were cute and cuddly i never thought they were amusing at all there was always something about them that just made me i don't know well when I was probably 11, two clowns in a van, do you remember the clowns in the vans? Approached my friends and I, and they pulled up. The driver was laughing. I don't really remember anything about the passenger, but I know he was also dressed as a clown. And they rolled the windows down and they were just laughing so loud. My friends and I ran for the hills. We were terrified. We told our parents, my grandmother, they acted like, that it wasn't a big deal and that it wasn't true. And in researching for this story, I found out that it happened all across the country and none of the kids were believed because the parents, the adults never saw the clowns. And I just thought, oh my God, that's so scary. <laughs> but luckily I survived because I ran for the hills because I was already afraid of clowns. This clown in particular, researching this story was, ugh. This man was a clown part-time and he would visit children's hospitals. He would do events. He just seemed like the nicest guy you could ever imagine. His name is John Wayne Gacy. He was born in March of 1942 in Chicago. He was the only son of three children. They were all 18 months apart. His parents were John Stanley Gacy and Marion Robinson. Uh, as a child, Gacy was, he had a, a pretty rough childhood. And before we begin, I am not making excuses, but I thought that it would lend to this story to tell you about his childhood. He was severely abused by his father. His father was a functioning alcoholic who worked to provide for the family. He remembered one time when he was about four or five, he messed up the car parts in the garage and his father beat him so severely. Another time, his father smacked him across the head with a broom and caused him to pass out. His dad felt like boys were supposed to be tough. Boys were supposed to fit into a mold and do what boys were supposed to do. And John did not fit into that mold. One other time, he stole a truck from a local store and his mother brought him home and told his father what he had done and he beat him with, with what is called a razor strope. I always thought it was a razor strap, but it isn't. Um, and that was not uncommon to be beat that way. He beat him so bad, his mother intervened. And when she did, his father called him a sissy, a mama's boy, and told him he'd probably grow up to be queer his words, not mine. After beating him, John's dad would often retreat to the basement. In 1949, Gacy's father was told that John and another friend had fondled a younger girl. His dad again whooped him with one of those razor straps as punishment. Not too long after that, John was molested himself by a close family friend, and he was so terrified to tell anybody in the family he never did this didn't come out until years and years later john was a sickly kid on top of everything else he had a heart condition and that often caused him to be very limited in his physical activity because he would be out of breath he as a result became overweight and we know how kids can be he was bullied unrelentlessly by the kids in his class and also in the neighborhood, but more importantly, by his own father. His dad wanted him to fish and to run around and do boy things, but John just wasn't interested. When he was around 11, he was hit in the head with a swing while he was on the playground and he started experiencing blackouts. His father, even after numerous doctor's visits, decided he was faking all of this, that he just wanted some kind of attention. The doctors never could diagnose exactly what was happening, 
but his father determined it was all made up. These blackouts weren't real. Many killers that you learn about, you hear, one of the signs is that they abuse animals, and John might have been the exception to that rule. He had two dogs that he loved dearly, and it's been said that his father actually killed one of the dogs in front of the children. That had to have been so traumatic. In any case, years of being in and out of the hospital, his dad still saying he was doing this for sympathy and attention. Uh, they found a blood clot in his brain and they were able to do surgery and correct it and, and help him, but he still had the episodes on and off for a little while. Due to falling, being in the hospital so much, obviously you fall behind in school, not that that was something that John ever liked to go to anyway. He decided that was it, I'm going to drop out and he did. This further lent to the idea from his father, the opinion that he was not only lazy and overweight, but he was also stupid. Another story that I found while researching this was that one time a friend of John's was over and saw that John had found his mother's underwear and had them underneath the porch in the crawl space. And it's been said, it's been rumored that John was forced to wear them when his mother found out. How true that is, I'm really not sure, but I think that that would be fairly traumatic. Um, keep the crawl space where he buried these in mind as we go on with this story. When Gacy turned 18, he decided that he'd you know, he, he, he was very close to having enough. He tried, though, to join a local Democratic Party, and he was an assistant precinct captain. And now while that isn't a big job for John, it was huge. He was thinking, you know, I'm getting so much positive attention. You know, maybe my dad is going to respect that I'm doing this. You know, it wasn't prestigious, but it was something and he developed his gift for gab, and he really enjoyed the attention he was getting. But his dad quickly killed any idea that he was going to be proud of him. He belittled Gacy's association with the party, and he called him a party patsy. Soon after that, he purchased a car with the help of his father, with a loan, and he was paying, making payments. But technically, his dad paid for that car, so anytime John would try to take the car and leave, if he had done anything to make his dad unhappy, which could be something or nothing, his dad would take the keys. He would go so far to re remove the distributor cap so that John couldn't get anywhere. And John got sick of that really quick, and he ran away to Las Vegas. Run away is a strong word because he was already 18. He could leave if he wanted to, but this was his first time out on his own. And he did okay at first. He got a job with an ambulance service for a very short period and was transferred to a the mortuary. And he was an, employed there as an attendant. He often spent his nights at the mortuary alone. And he would sleep there on a cot near their embalming room. On the very last night that Gacy was there, how this happened or what his mind was thinking when he did this, we don't know. He climbed into the coffin of a young teenage boy and he began to fondle him. He woke up in the morning lying on top of the boy. And afterwards, he was so shocked and confused that he felt sexually aroused by this, that he called his mother and asked her if he could come home. Of course, he didn't tell her why. He just asked if it would be okay if he returned home. I can't imagine doing something like that, but that was one of the very first things that ever happened that John tells about that gives us a little bit of a peek inside of what's about to happen with John. John drove back to Chicago and he again lived with his parents. Now, John hadn't completed high school as he had dropped out, 
Maybe things were different back then, but he was accepted into Northwestern Business College, and he did graduate from there in 1963. He took a management position, a management trainee position at Nunn Bush Shoe Company, and he was quickly transferred to Springfield, Illinois, and he was promoted into a management position. While he was at the shoe company, he met a lady and they began to date. Her name was Marlon Myers. She was employed with him. She actually worked for him in his department and her parents were pretty well off. Uh, she wasn't poor like Gacy's parents were. I mean, I guess Gacy's parents did okay. They didn't have a lot, but they had enough. Marlon's parents were definitely a different story. During his first year in Springfield, he became very, very involved with a local junior chamber group, which is called the JCs, J-A-Y-C-E-E-S. The JC Creed is pretty interesting. It states, we believe that faith in God gives meaning and purpose to human life that the brotherhood of man transcends the sovereignty of nations and that service to humanity is the best life work. John dedicated so much time to this organization. He became really great at self-promoting, utilizing his sales training that he had through the shoe company. He rose through the ranks so quickly and earned the title of key man. He also realized that he was good at fundraising and he began to do that for the JCs. By 1965, he was appointed the vice president of the JCs Springfield Division. Later that year, he was also recognized as being the third most outstanding JC in the state of Illinois. Now, this is a guy who's coming from a childhood where there was no value. There was nobody telling them that they were proud of him or that he accomplished anything. So for him, he was full of confidence and self-esteem now. He was married. He had a good future before him. He had persuaded people into believing he was really a leader. The one thing that threatened everything was his desires inside. He had those desires and there was not much he could do to quell them. Marilyn's dad soon offered Gacy a position managing his three Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants. He would be earning a salary of $15,000 a year. That's like $195,000 right now. So they left. They moved to Waterloo, Iowa and stayed in her parents' home rent-free. Gacy soon joined the JCs in Waterloo. And in 1967, he received Outstanding Vice President of the Waterloo JCs. He also earned a seat on the Board of Directors. Some people felt in the Waterloo division that he was kind of a braggart. He was a little off. They'll remember him as. He was insisting that people call him Colonel for his position with KFC. Of course, people felt that that was awkward and weird, but they did it. You know, they, they amused him. He was an important guy there. He wasn't just another Joe coming through. He was the vice president. He was on the board of directors. He was doing all this fundraising. The thing about the Waterloo JCs, though, they had a very dark side. Illegal drug use, wife swapping, prostitution, pornography. Gacy slid right into the position of managing and participating in all of these activities. He began to act on his desires at this time, too. He, his sexual fantasies were now coming true. He was a man to be listened to. And he was setting up all of these escapades for other married men who were in this organization. So he felt like he was becoming so important that he could get away with this. He was enticing the young boys to his basement where he had set up kind of this clubhouse type thing where there was pornography, they called them stag films then, and alcohol and drugs, and the kids wanted to be there, of course. So did many of the married men. Gacy would then take advantage of these boys once they became too intoxicated to put up any real resistance. 
And while Gacy was busy molesting teenagers, his wife was having their first child. Their first kid was a boy named Michael in 1967. And then their second child was born a year later, and it was a girl. At this point, Gacy remembers never being happier or more proud of his life. It was almost perfect, really. I know that's a warped way of thinking about it if you're saying, wait a minute, didn't you just say he was molesting teenagers? In his mind, life was perfect. His parents even came in to visit him when he had his son, and his father finally told him for the first time, I'm proud of you. I was wrong about you. And for John, that's all he ever wanted to hear. So things were great. But in August of 1967, Gacy hired a 15-year-old boy named Donald Voorhees to do odd jobs around his house. He met Gacy through his father, who was also in the Jaycees. After finishing his work, Gacy lured Donald into his basement with the promise of free beer and pornography. After Gacy had supplied him with an abundance of alcohol, he forced him into having oral sex. Donald was just the first of many. He had convinced some of them that he was running a scientific program, a scientific research program, and he would pay the participants $50 for each session, and it was a program around looking at the sexuality of boys. He also used blackmail as a way to force some of them into sexual submission. Of course, nobody wanted anybody to know what they were doing with Gacy, so he would blackmail them. Many months later, seven months later, March of 68, Donald Voorhees told his father about the incident with Gacy in the basement and his father was enraged. He immediately reported it to the police, and at that same time, a 16-year-old victim also reported that Gacy forced him into oral sodomy. So Gacy's world is starting now to crumble a little bit, but Gacy, being who he was, strongly denied all of this. He insisted to the police that he take a polygraph test. Later, the police joked the only truthful part of the polygraph was when John stated his name. In his defense, John claimed that these accusations were a plan by Voorhees Sr., who was trying to sabotage his efforts to become president of the Iowa JCs. And some people believed that. They thought that it was sabotage, that the elder Voorhees just didn't like Gacy and didn't want him to continue advancing in the JCs. Despite all his protests, though, he was indicted on the sodomy charges. That wasn't enough for Gacy, though. He paid one of his employees, an 18-year-old named Russell, $300 to go beat up young Donald and warn him against showing up in court. And again, Voorhees went straight to the police, who in turn arrested Russell. He quickly admitted that it was all Gacy's plan. It wasn't his plan, it was Gacy's plan to do this. So now, not only was he in trouble for the sodomy charge, but he was charged with conspiracy and assault. By the time it was all over, he pled guilty to sodomy and received a 10-year prison sentence. On that very same day, his wife filed for divorce. Gacy was so angry that he told her if she was to go through with it, she and the kids were dead to him and he never wanted to see them again. And sadly, he never did. On Christmas Day of 69, Gacy's father died, cirrhosis of the liver. The news hit Gacy so hard that it was reported he hit the ground and the prison guards tried to help him out, but he was destroyed. He felt that his dad's last memory would be that he was convicted of sodomy and that his father had died of a broken heart. Gacy then decided he was going to do everything that he could to change his life. He earned his high school degree. He got the job of head cook in the prison. He even did a little interview with TV while he was in there. He helped the JCs grow from 50 to 650 while in prison. And in October of 1971, just 18 months into his sentence, 
he was released and placed on probation for 12 months. 10-year sentence down to 18 months. He moved in with his mother and got a job working as a cook, and he also worked some construction jobs. He had a curfew of 10 p.m. Gacy later bought a house with his mother about 30 miles outside of Chicago in Des Plaines, Illinois. That's where the rest of the story will take place. In early February of 1971, Gacy lured a teenage boy to his home and tried to rape him. But that boy luckily escaped and went to the police. Gacy was charged with sexual assault. Now this is 30 miles away from where he was charged before. These charges were dismissed because the teen didn't show up in court. And because of the distance and lack of technology, this information never got back to his parole officer. On January 2nd of 1972, Timothy Jack McCoy, age 16, planned on sleeping in a bus terminal in Chicago. His next bus wasn't scheduled until the following day, but Gacy saw him and approached him and promised to take him around the city and give him a tour and let him sleep in his home for the night. Timothy thought this was a pretty good deal, so he took him up on it. This was a different day and time. We would not expect our kids to do that now, but back then, Timothy didn't see a big deal. The next morning, Gacy wakes up and sees McCoy standing near him with a knife. Gacy thought the teen was perhaps trying to murder him or something. So he gets up, he charges at him, and the gets control of this knife and stabs the teen to death. He doesn't realize until later that he had made a huge mistake. Timothy was actually cooking breakfast for them and still had the knife in his hand when he came to wake Gacy up. Not that this mattered. Not that it mattered that he didn't plan on killing him because Gacy later admits that none of that was intentional, but it gave him the biggest sexual release he had ever had. And he knew then what was about to happen. He will say that he never planned the things that were about to happen but there's no denying the fact that when he killed Timothy, he said it was the most intense pleasure he had ever felt in his entire life. Timothy was the first person to be buried in the crawl space under Gacy's home, and he covered it with a layer of concrete. In July of 72, Gacy married his high school sweetheart, Carol Hoff. She and her two very young daughters moved in with Gacy. Carol was aware that Gacy had spent time in prison, but he downplayed the charges so much that she accepted it. Her two children called him dad from the very beginning, and by all accounts, they loved him, and he loved them. Within weeks of marrying Carol, he was arrested and charged with sexual assault after a teen said that he impersonated a cop and forced him to get into his car and engage in oral sex. Again, the charges were dropped because this time the victim tried to blackmail Gacy. In 1973, Gacy and some of his young employees traveled to Florida and they were going to view a property that Gacy had purchased. On the very first night there, Gacy assaulted one of the boys. When they were returned to Chicago, that employee drove to Gacy's home and beat the hell out of him in front of his yard. His mother-in-law came running out and stopped the boy. Gacy told his wife and mother-in-law the kid did it because he didn't pay him because the kid did poor work. Gacy spent time reestablishing himself at this time as a good neighbor, a good community leader. He worked tirelessly on community projects. He had several neighborhood parties. He would open his house to everybody. He developed extremely close friendships with his neighbors and business owners. He became a very familiar face in town. He started to dress as Pogo the Clown for birthday parties at the children's hospital, and he didn't use typical clown makeup. You know how clowns look so happy and round? The mouth on Pogo was extremely scary. I'm not sure why nobody ever pointed this out to him, but when you look at the pictures, you wonder what those kids must have been thinking. Overall, people like John. 
By day, he was this successful business owner and community do-gooder. But by night... <laughs> in January of 74, John killed again. The time exactly and the name of this person was unknown. He buried the man in his backyard. John began to work a lot more. He would often spend time cruising, as he called it. In July of 75, John went to the home of one of his employees named Antonio. Antonio was home alone from school, having injured his foot. John gave Antonio quite a bit of liquor and eventually wrestled him to the floor, cuffing his hands. Now, Antonio was a wrestler at his school, and he was able to get one hand free and flip John and get on top of him and somehow get the key. He freed himself. He then turned the tables and put the cuffs on John. After threatening him, then apologizing, threatening him and apologizing, Antonio finally took the cuffs off. And he recalled John saying, not only are you the only one to ever get these off, but you got them on me. John did this trick with people where he would put the cuffs on them and tell them that there was a trick to it. And it's been rumored that John would tell them the trick is you have to have the key. Most of those people died. Antonio got very lucky to be able to get out of that situation. A week later, one of his employees disappeared named John Budkovich. Gacy later admitted luring Budkovich to his home while his wife and stepchildren were out of town in Arkansas. He says that he invited him there because there was a, an argument over overdue wages. But Gacy had conned the youth into allowing his wrist to be cuffed again using his trick at which point Gacy strangled him to death and buried his body under the concrete floor of his garage. Gacy later admitted having sat on the kid's chest for a while before killing him. The kid's car was later found abandoned in a parking lot with the youth wallet inside, the keys still in the ignition. So John is now getting a little bit more creative. He's bringing all of these things to his home while he has a wife and children who live there as well. Budkovich's father called Gacy and Gacy claimed, I'm happy to help you, but it sounds to me like he just ran away. In October of 1975, his wife filed for divorce. Gacy had admitted to her that he was attracted to young men. Carol wasn't at all surprised about this. Months before on Mother's Day, he had informed her that they would not be having sex again. She was also bothered by seeing all of these young men coming in and out. There were porn magazines around the house and things that she just couldn't ignore. So she was perfectly fine with getting divorced. And so was he. John knew that with Carol and the kids out of the way, he could focus on what really mattered to him most, keeping up this appearance that he was this wonderful man in the community and his sexual needs. With nobody left in the house to stop him from doing any of this, things quickly got crazy. From 76 to 78, Gacy managed to hide the bodies of 29 of his victims under his house. But because of lack of space and the odor, he dumped five of his last bodies into a river. All of these people buried in this house and nobody ever caught on until the very end. December 11th of 1978, 15 year old Robert Peist went missing after leaving his job at the pharmacy. He told his mother, who was there to pick him up that night, that he was running outside to talk to a contractor about a good paying job in a summer position. He also told his coworker the same thing. This contractor had been in the pharmacy earlier in the evening to discuss a upcoming job with the owner, and he left his appointment book there. 
So the contractor leaves and then he comes back. And when he comes back, he sees Robert. And he knew what he was going to do. And he offered Robert a job and cons Robert to get into his car, telling him, your mother would want you to get this job, wouldn't she? She would be so excited for you. It was Robert's mother's birthday. And the family was waiting for him to cut the cake. And his mother was waiting in the store. And he disappeared. She never saw Gacy. She only knew her son was running outside for just a minute. And after about 20 minutes, she goes outside and she's searching for him everywhere. Where could he have gone? And Robert was not the kind of kid who would just run away, who would just leave without telling her, never. She refused to believe that. Her and her husband, his sister and his brother all went to the police. They were so concerned. They knew something was wrong. And thank God that they did. Eventually, Gacy was contacted by the police. Now, the owner of the pharmacy had no qualms about telling the parents that Gacy was a good man, not to really worry. The police end up calling Gacy and he says, sure, yeah, I was there, but I never spoke to this teenager. This was contradicting what the fellow employee and Robert's mother knew to be true. According to that employee, Robert was upset because he had been turned down earlier in that day by the owner of the pharmacy when he asked for a raise. Robert was saving up to get a Jeep. And he was so excited when this contractor mentioned a job that paid double what he was making at this pharmacy. The coworker had no doubt in her mind that Robert left with this contractor man. Gacy denied he had ever even spoke to the boy. He understood that, you know, maybe, maybe somebody got it wrong, but he never spoke to him. He may have seen him. He may have glanced at him, but he knew nothing of him. The investigators ended up running a background check on Gacy and they got back his conviction in prison time for sodomizing that minor. The information put Gacy on the top of the list of potential suspects. But there was nothing they could do. They had no proof yet. On, De on December 13th of 78, a warrant to search Gacy Somerdale Avenue home was granted. While investigators searched his home and cars, he was at the police station giving a, an oral and written statement about his activities at the pharmacy on the night that Robert disappeared. When he learned that there was a search going on at his home, he went into a fit of rage. That gave them even more indication that somehow he was involved in this. Not because he said anything, but because of the air that he gave off on how important he was and how dare they be in his home. He was very full of himself. The evidence that they collected at his house, a high school ring from 1975 with the initials JAS, handcuffs, drugs, drug paraphernalia, two driver's licenses that were not Gacy's, child pornography, police badges, guns and ammunition, a switchblade, a piece of stained carpet, hair samples from Gacy's automobiles, store receipts, and several items of teen-styled clothing that would not fit Gacy, who was a large, round man. Investigator, investigators also went down to the crawl space. They were in it and they didn't discover anything and left quickly due to the rancid odor but they attributed that to a sewage leak. Although the police had solidified suspicions that Gacy was likely an active pedophile, it didn't turn up any evidence leaking him, linking him to Robert at all. They knew he was the prime suspect. They knew something was off, but they had nothing. There was nothing they could put their hands on to grab this guy. Two surveillance teams were told to watch Gacy 24 hours a day to never let him out of their sight. The investigators continued to search for Robert, interview his friends, the coworkers. They also began interviewing people who had contact with Gacy on a regular basis. When investigators learned that Robert was a 
very good kid. He loved his family. He was reliable. They never were away from each other without somebody knowing what was going on. Gacy, on the other hand, had the makings of a monster. They also learned that Robert was probably not the first, but likely the fourth person who had disappeared after having contact with Gacy. They also learned the ring belonged to a young man named John Allen. John's mother informed them that a TV in John's car were also missing. Not surprisingly, Gacy's employee was driving that car. Meanwhile, Gacy seemed to be enjoying the game of cat and mouse with the police. He was able to sneak away from them, sneak away from his house undetected. He was so bold that he would invite the team into his home. On a couple of occasions, he served them breakfast and then would joke about spending the rest of the day running around to hide dead bodies. Can you imagine the balls on this man? Eight days into the investigation, the lead detective went to Robert's home to try to bring his parents up to date. During this conversation, Robert's mother mentioned a conversation that she had with one of the employees working that same night. Her name was Kim. The employee explained to Robert's mother that she had borrowed Robert's coat because she was working up at the front desk and it was freezing. So she was wearing Robert's coat when she left on her break and she left a receipt in the jacket pocket. This was the same jacket that Robert put back on when he left to go outside to talk to Mr. Gacy and never returned. That same receipt was found in the evidence collected during the search of Gacy's house. Just this receipt is what helped them. Forensic testing was performed on the receipt and that proved that Gacy had been lying the entire time about Robert being at the house. The receipt was actually in the trash and they found it. And if it hadn't been for Kim speaking up and remembering that tiny little detail, we don't know. A bunch of people who were close to Gacy were interviewed by detectives on multiple occasions. After that, Gacy would demand, he would threaten them, tell me everything that they said, every single thing that they asked. This included all the in-depth questioning of his employees regarding the crawl space underneath Gacy's home. Some of these employees did admit that Gacy had paid them to go down to specific areas of the crawl space and to dig, dig trenches and spread out lime. How did they never notice? that there were bodies down there, or what this smell was. Gacy knew at this point, it's only a matter of time before they get me. He began to buckle under all the pressure and his behavior, of course, already bizarre clown and wonderful man by day and crazy psychopath at night. Now he was doing drugs and driving all over the place to the homes of his friends, telling them goodbye. He was seen taking tons of pills, drinking early in the morning. He talked about committing suicide and allegedly confessed to many people that he had killed over 30 people. What finally led to his arrest, and this is so crazy, was he did a drug deal right in front of detectives but it gave them enough that they were able to walk over, grab him and place him under arrest. While in police custody, Gacy was informed that a second search warrant of his home had been issued. The news brought on chest pains, according to Gacy, and he was taken into the hospital. In the meantime, they began to really search that house, particularly that crawl space. The extent of what would be uncovered shocked even the most seasoned detectives who felt like they had seen everything. Gacy knew then, I'm in so much trouble now. And he was released from the hospital that night and taken back into custody. And he knew, he knew the game was up. He confessed to the murder of Robert 
and then he confessed to an additional 32 murders, starting in 74, and he hinted that the total could be as high as 45 people. During the confessions, John explained how he had restrained his victims. He gave the detectives details. He told them he would pretend to do the magic trick. They required they put their hands in the handcuffs. And then, of course, they never got out of these. He would stuff socks or underwear into their mouths. He used boards that had chains in them and he would place that under their chest and wrap the chains around their neck. He would then choke them to death while raping them. Many of his victims were uncovered with plastic bags around their head or around their torso. One strange, gruesome thing that some of the victims were found with were objects like prescription bottles inserted into them. Through dental and radiology records, 25 of the 33 bodies were identified fairly quickly. In an effort to identify the remaining unknown victims, DNA had been tested as technology got better from 2011 to 2016. Robert's body was not in the crawl space. It was discovered much later, entangled in exposed roots on the edge of the Des Plaines River. Gacy went on trial February 6th of 1980 for the murder of 33 young men. His defense lawyers tried to prove that Gacy was insane, but five of the, five, the jury of five men and seven women didn't agree. He had drawn the locations of the bodies. He remembered so many details. He was absolutely not insane. The jury quickly delivered a verdict of guilty and the death penalty was given for Gacy. While he was on death row, he continued with his games. This was not a man who could be changed. He would taunt the authorities and the different doctors who would come in to see him with different versions of the murders, just in an attempt to stay alive. He also was allowed to paint and to sell his work. Some of his work has sold for $20,000. But when his appeals were all exhausted, the execution day was set. On John Gacy's very last day on this earth, his last meal was KFC chicken, a dozen shrimp, french fries, diet coke, and fresh strawberries. John Gacy was executed by lethal injection on May 9th of 1994. John's last words were, kiss my ass. Imagine those being your last words, kiss my ass, after everything he had admitted to. John's brain was taken and it was analyzed and they could find nothing. They thought maybe analyzing his brain would give them some hint, some indication of how a man of this stature, who seems so likable by most people, could do the things that he did to lead these double lives, but they were unable to find anything. John was able to fool a huge community of people. And if it wasn't for the dedication of that police force and for the insistence of Robert's family, I think he would have went on for many, many more years doing the things that he did. It's also been said that John had help. And there were articles up until last year saying that this is very possible. John detailed everything that he did in notebooks and planners and schedules. Every trip that he took, everywhere that he went was written down. He was OCD in that way. And it's been confirmed that on some of the occasions, he was not in town. And these people were buried in his crawl space. So you have to ask, who were these people? Were they employees of his who helped him out? Is that why they were able to go down to that crawl space and dig trenches and not be terrified at what they were seeing down there? John never said. He hinted 
that he had help. But he never named anybody. He wouldn't say. One of the things that John was so concerned about, really concerned about in interviews, when he would speak to doctors, is that he never wanted anybody to think he was gay. That was so important to him. More important than the memory or being sorry about what he had done. But don't ever think that he was gay or as he called it, a fruit picker. He was bisexual. He admitted to that, but he was not gay. That is what he wanted people to remember. His brain being taken and looked at and dissected to try to understand how somebody does something like this. I mean, I suppose it would have been helpful if we could get a reason, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. These young men were all taken from their families by somebody who had all of these people fooled. And it, it can't help, it can't, it can't stop you from, from living your life, but at the same time, how do you not go look at the guy in the Walmart and think, oh my gosh, doing these kind of stories, I love them, but they scare the hell out of me. I walk around and I look at everybody and I'm suspicious. <laughs> and you don't want to let it control your life, but you have to be cautious at the same time. And we are only one story in. We have got six more to go. I hope you'll be back for those videos. Thanks for watching.